Hi, I'm Darwin Campbell, and I'm the program coordinator for the uh, Dill Lab here at Iowa State University. That's Carolyn Lawrence's um, a lab that um, Jack and I are both a part of. And Jack is is uh, off-site at University of Missouri in Columbia, and he works in the, a curator role between our lab and Maze GDB. And we're going to spend a little bit of time talking about some of the tools and the different things that we have done to help standardize some of the data collection and um, to help the uh, collaborators as they move through the uh, growing trials and the growing season. Just very briefly, what genome? What is genomes to field? And then also the genomes by environment or genotype by environment sub project. You can see what um, that. What we're primarily interested with in our lab is the information management resources. What's what can we do? as a group to help direct the flow of information and, and data that is collected by the researchers in, you know, in, a, in a, collaborative, uh, a collaborative environment. You can see that we have basically 14 core phenotypes that are being collected, and then we also have um, 14 uh, weather and environmental measurements that are collected on each site. The, uh, there's generally about one weather station per uh, research trial, and those are collecting um, times or information on 15 minute increments throughout a 24 hour period from the time the, the weather station goes into, into service until the time it comes out. You can imagine in a distributed environment with the number of people, oh, I'm sorry, line number three. Oh, sorry. I should have I moved ahead there, I'm, I apologize. So on slide number three, you can see the distributed nature of the project. Um, when you have that many people distributed from you know that large of a geographic area, and no one group is in charge of all the decisions that are making things happen, you, you really it's you struggle to find a way to uh, communicate and coordinate all the data the data that can come in throughout the entire year. That's not just when you get done with the, the uh, field notebooks, but you know, how do you organize people and get information out to them? And so that's, this group really struggled in, in 2014 just trying to get organized. And based upon that struggle, we moved to slide four. In 2015, we generated the standard operating procedure for the, um, for the project. This document, I don't remember how many pages exactly it is. I think it must be probably 30 pages, roughly. It was provided in hard copy and electronic copy um, to all the collaborators and anybody that's associated with the project. One of the things that we'll be touching on here in just a little bit, you can see by the link underneath the red bar there, the, the, I, or the iPlant Collaborative Wiki. Um, I have to admit, I'm kind of a wiki junkie. I like wikis just because it has, seems to offer a lot of flexibility. You can incorporate a lot of different, um, very viable communication into one in, one uh, platform there. So I, if, you, if, you, if it sounds like I'm a wiki evangelist, I apologize because that's probably what it will come off as. One of the things that we've leveraged at, at iPlant Collaborative is this listserv. Um, you can see in it's uh, Roman numeral number two that every cooperator is is enrolled in this listserv so we don't have to keep track of changing email addresses and that kind of stuff. We can just add people, remove them as they come along. You'll also see down um, down the road here in a couple of slides that there's a, um, a help email address that goes to those of us that are in more of a supportive role to the project that we can, um, you know, they can directly email uh, information to us. Move on to slide number five. One of the things that the standard operating procedure has um, has provided us is a way to organize uh, uh, tasks that every researcher or every collaborator is going to encounter throughout the growing season. And if you just do a tap through a couple times here, you'll see red boxes. It just highlights that you know you have preseason planting, in season, and then those can, those groupings of tasks um, 
continue clear down through the growing year, and then they kind of culminate at the end of the year when you actually do your data upload process. Number six, part of the information that seems a little mundane to include into the standard operating procedure because you would think that everybody would would know how to deal with the watchdog weather station configuration. Well, in fact, they do, but sometimes we forget to check the batteries, we forget to turn them on, we put them on the field, or we turn them on and we set them out in the lab, and then they, they um, fire out a whole bunch of really bad um, data lines to us that you know, don't have any value. So we and help people, you know, we're, we're trying to get it to be uh, consistent to, you know, locate the, um, the station within, you know, a quarter mile of the trial, you know, that should be something everybody should shoot for, and that, that shouldn't be too hard to do. If you go to slide seven, it also includes things like, you know, how to protect the cables that are going to be hooked up to the sensors. You know, we found out in 2014 that critters like the sensor cables, and they, in fact, chewed several of those off. So here's a custom-made little cable protector, and it's how we um, install those and, and place those, because it is important, like on this one, for the... Uh, soil temperature sensor to be away from the vertical pipe and all that kind of stuff. So we have standards that we've asked them to participate in to make sure that their, um, um, their, their sensor is in the right location. As we move on to slide eight, we also include in the standard operating procedure a phenotyping handbook. And this is, we talked about the phenotypes that um, every researcher is going to collect for all of their trials. And it's one thing to, to list them and identify how you're going to um, count that data. And if you go uh, one click forward, we'll spend a little time here looking at the ear height. To, and if you go to slide nine, all of those phenotypes, or most of them that are being collected out in the field, they have pictures of what we're expecting um, the, the researchers to how we, how we want them to measure the data. And this isn't necessarily just for the researchers that's in charge of that trial, but if they may be giving this task off to um, a, a set of undergrads or graduate students and say, here, you go do this for our field. And, and this way, everybody, regardless of their where they're at in that uh, research progress or process, they're going to be reporting very similar type of data. The first year out, people were reporting some units were in inches, some were in centimeters. Some of the weather data came in in, in Celsius. Some of it came in, in in Fahrenheit. So this is just a, another step to, to help people get to that point of having consistent data types. If we move on to slide 10, this is where we're going to start talking a little bit about how we've used the wiki and also how we've used the uh, Google Sheets application in a, in a Google uh, page. On the in the back window, you can see the wiki page. It starts out with navigation, and it, there's several bullets listed there. One of the things that we've done in the wiki is we've made an attempt to help people um, report and get access to what they need access to. Not because we're trying to um, control where people go, but we're wanting to help them get the right information in where they need to go. Um, for example, if you look down underneath the data collection, um, uh, Roman numeral one there, you know, people that are working in uh, Delaware, they don't really need access to Indiana's worksheets. Um, you know, that, and the easy way to keep that from accidentally, somebody accidentally clicking on the wrong link is just to link it up and provide access through the, the wiki permissions, which is, I might add, is very, very easy to do. Um, we also include in the wiki a very detailed instruction sheet that outlines what types of data needs to go into the sheet when you're filling out, in this case, the metadata sheet. Um, and we, we talk about, you know, how to enter the latitude and longitude. Um, one of the in 2014, uh, we had lots of them that were in degrees, minutes, and seconds instead of the uh, decimal notation. 
Well, that it's not that it can't be decoded. It's just harder to, you know, get everybody on the same page there. If you look down at the bottom, there is a link um, that uh, has sample and has HTTPS colon, and then there's a short Google URL there. You guys can go in and you can take a look at that uh, worksheet. There's a, it's a sample one that I put up that you, you can do whatever you want to it, um, and you can kind of get a sense for what we're how that sheet interacts or how the users can interact with these worksheets. If you go to slide 11, this is a zoom in of, of what like the Delaware um, from the wiki page again. When, did, when people in the Delaware group click on their link, this is where they're going to go. Now, it, it's not very pretty. There's not a whole lot there, but one of the things that the wiki does offer us is if you have a user that wants to go in and, and they're spending time in the wiki and they go, oh, I need to go edit my uh, metadata sheet or we'll look at my field book. Using an iframe, we can just embed that right into the wiki page. So when they come into their, their page link here, they're looking at their Google document. If you do a forward arrow, and we're, it, sh it should highlight um, there's a, a link to upload files. And if we go to number slide 12, this is where we're going to be. Well, I'm not going to spend a lot of time talking about it, but we've used very ext very extensively the uh, discovery environment as a data store for the project. Um, the group in 2014, um, they spent a lot of time storing files in Dropbox. Uh, they stored it in, their, in various Google Drives. Um, one week the current set might be in user A, and the next week it would be in user B. And there really wasn't any um, single point to, to get that data, the most current data sets. And so we have, and I think very success, success, uh, successfully, moved everybody's upload point to the, direct, to the discovery environment. And one of the things that it allows allows, like the wiki, is that fine grain access point into a directory structure on the Discover environment. So again, if I'm asking Delaware to upload their files and they can only put them in the Delaware directory, they can't put them accidentally in another directory. So that part of it has worked out very, very well. Um, you can see here in the middle of the screen in that red text box, there's a G2F under bar help email address there. And I mentioned a little bit ago how we're, these are listservs managed by a mailman application at iPlant. And the reason we did that is um, originally we started out thinking we're going to have a mailman list here at Iowa State. Well, the problem is, you know, then it would be G2F help at IE State. And we didn't like that because it's not our project. It doesn't belong to any one person. And that's where the, the have, having the mailman list available at iPlant takes that individual identity out of it and gives it back to the group. And so I think that's, that's been helpful in just a, 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 general, a general way. If we go to slide 13, we'll take a look here. Uh, we should now have the shareable link listed there. And so that link is going to take us to, in the next couple of screenshots, the spreadsheet that is that you're looking at in the bottom, except it's outside the wiki. And the reason we did this is because the, the sheet that we're look, going to be looking at is going to be available to anybody that has any kind of a mobile device of any sort using Google Sheets. And so if you have a phone and you want to put something in your Google Doc out in the field, you can do that. If you want to do it, you know, from any web browser without being logged into the wiki, you can do that. This link that you see up here, uh, I should have probably blocked it out, but I didn't. Anybody can get to that link. Um, so if you happen to go there, please don't mess with their data. That would be bad. All right, so if we go to number 14. This is the, um, so you can, if you look down at the bottom of the red box, there's a Delaware Hybrid 1, and there's also a Delaware Hybrid 1 field book. And so we keep those, the Hybrid 1 is the metadata, and obviously the field book is the field book data. 
can we'll just skip through here. You can you can take a look at a couple of the um, um, the different columns that we have. If you go to slide 15, you can see that it goes out and you can see that year height and stand count, and root lodging, and all that stuff. Um, all of this information, of course, in the Google Sheet, it's very easy to extract that out as Excel or CSV or tab delimited file. One of the tasks that, that I just figured out here today was that it, it also is very easy to read the, the sheet data out with uh, the Google Sheets API, and you can use JSON to reformat that data. So um, that's kind of a next step of where we're going to go with this is, is go ahead and let people use the Google Sheet just because it's convenient. We can look at it with the researchers if there's any questions and we can help them uh, without having to send a whole bunch of emails back and forth. We can just go to the link and away we go. We also have embedded as a last tab on all the sheets that everybody would get to is the instructions and that is just as a uh, a large image that is duplicated from the wiki, so they have constant information from the wiki to the sheet that if they're out in the field and they're not sure what goes in there, um, they can get to the instructions right there. I might draw your attention to, um, if you look at the round bullet number five, you'll see that above that there's a little green box. I apologize, I, I, I should have zoomed in a little bit more. And it says check it. What this is, is if when they enter the latitude and the longitude, there will be a link that shows up in that window. And if they click check it, it opens up um, a new browser window and it will actually take them in Google Maps and it will take them to that very, uh, very point location in their Google Map. So they can verify if they have put in the right, uh, um, the right latitude and longitude coordinates for that point. And you can see that there's there's four um, four points available for the, the plot latitude and longitude. The same thing is available up right below bullet number four that has the uh, latitude and longitude of the weather station. So they can verify that their location is correct. And it's not that we're, you know, we just want people to give us good information. And one way we can do this is to help them by making it easy for them to verify that. This Google Sheet also is just full of um, data validations. So if we're expecting something to be in a value less than 30, for example, or 36, let's say for the, the, the rows that they're going to plant their, their corn in, and we want that to be less than 36 so they don't actually, accidentally put in you know, a large value, we can cap that. Um, we just have, you know, whenever we're asking for a date, they have to format that as a date value. And it's much like a lot of the things that we've seen um, collectively that we've used in, in Excel documents. If we go to number 17, if I know that, that a lot of people have had a lot of varying uh, degrees of, of successful interactions with iPlant Collaborative. Um, and I guess they're, they are renamed now to Cybers. I have to be honest and tell you that, that we wouldn't be where we're at if we didn't leverage the resources that we have with iPlant's support and help. Um, they have just really bent over backwards to provide us the resources we need. For example, in the discovery environment, that's going to be a data repository for the year scans that are being taken from uh, University of Wisconsin. Well, no single group had the... Um, the disk capacity to store all those scans. And once the scans get put up on iPlant, then you're half a click away from being able to use the BISC environment to do image analysis. So it makes 100% logical sense to store that data close to where it's going to be analyzed. And so, you know, what we're using really heavy right now is the discovery environment. Um, atmosphere, and I'll turn this part over to Jack here in just a second, and then also the wiki that they're providing to us. So those three resources have actually just been, you know, a tremendous support to us. One thing that I'll briefly touch before Jack does the, uh, the BMS part here is when we first started looking at BMS as being the, um, 
the place for us to store um, the germplasm and the, the phenotype traits and that kind of stuff. Um, it was just in a standalone environment on a Windows desktop PC. And that has since been rewritten. So it is uh, web capable and you have web access to uh, just about everything that's available in the Windows version. The only piece that, there, that is not available at this time as a core piece is the, uh, there's a statistical analysis package. It's a Windows-specific component. And that, my understanding is that's going to be replaced. But we do have two instances of BMS sitting down at iPlant. We have a test instance and then a production one. And um, there again, that you know, to, to get it to that level and to that point of accessibility, would been able, we would not have been able to do that without both um, iPlant support as well as LeafNode, who's the the core developers of the BMS system. Jack, do you want to take a piece here on the uh, BMS to talk about it? Sure, I'll talk just a little bit. Um, I don't have any slides up there, and I couldn't see them if I did. But um, so I've been working with the BMS, and we have really basically two different sets of data. We have a group of about 24 hybrid uh, uh, collection from 24 different um, uh, breeding locations on hybrids. Then we probably have that many more on inbreds as well, which is a separate experiment. We haven't done a lot with the inbred data. The focus has mostly been on the hybrid data so far. And my understanding going forward is, is that we probably won't be doing any more inbred trials. That was about 32 inbreds planted at all. I think there was maybe as many as 35 locations for 25 investigators. Um, but we are, I think, going to end up with two seasons of, of inbred data. But um, this season, 2015, they collected their second year of hybrid data. Um, I haven't actually seen that data yet. Mostly what I've been working with um, is the 2014 data. And each set contains about 500 hybrids. Um, and, you know, as Darwin said, there's the 14 traits. And then there's various uh, other metadata associated with each um, with each plot. And so what, we're, what I'm looking at in terms of trying to get into the BMS is a spreadsheet with about mm, somewhere around 500 rows and somewhere around 35 columns of, of various types of data. Um, working with the BMS, it's been challenging, but um, I have made uh, quite a bit of headway. I feel like I'm just sort of on the verge of, um, uh, of actually being able to load the data into the BMS. But there are little things that come up um, along the way that are you had no idea it's what was it Donald Rumsfeld said you don't know what you don't know and that's certainly been the case of with the BMS um, for example here's this one small thing is that um, in the hybrid trials sometimes we have multiple sources for say a common type of like B73 by Mo17 and they just didn't have a seed from one location so they used the seed from two different locations but they tracked so they know which location got which seed um, from what lot. But when I try and upload this into the BMS as two separate rows, one for location supplier A and one for supplier B, the BMS gives them one GID. That's something I did not anticipate um, in doing. Um, so now I have to figure out how to sort of deconvolute all that. Um, it collapsed those two columns or two who rose into one and gave it a single CID. But I think once you learn the system better, there are ways to actually track that. But that was not something I actually expected to see. So there are lots of little things um, uh, like that in the BMS. But I still have to say that the BMS is clearly the choice, the best choice going forward. It does have a fairly sophisticated um, ontology manager where you can either modify terms or, um, or, or add your own completely new terms. And um, I've been learning how to work with that uh, to get various um, uh, things about the field environment or the, the trial, the um, uh, various met pieces of metadata that are on the spreadsheet into the BMS. And um, uh, 
sometimes I create a term and it works, and other times I don't. And the frustrating part is, is that I don't really quite understand why. But nevertheless, um, um, I have been able to, to map most of my terms to, I guess, tables um, in the in the uh, uh, in the BMS. Um, I'm still sort of working out those details, but I think that um, the BMS is, is uh, going to be a really powerful system for us. Um, but we're still really trying to. Um, uh, find our way through it. But the installations have been stable at iPlant. Initially, we had a, a, a few problems, but we've kind of worked that out. So we have a, a, a production server and a development server. Ideally, you know, you make all your mistakes on the development server, and then you go to the production server, and you do what you learned how to do. Well, sometimes I make mistakes on, on the production server as well. But luckily with the BMS, we've been you can um, basically erase your mistakes. The only mistake that you can't erase in the BMS is when you upload germplasm, like say these 2,000 lines that accounted for 2014, 2015, I have no way to get them out. So there's just little things like that that you want to get it right the first time. But um, all in all, I think the BMS is going to turn out to be a, a, a good system for us. We're, we're still just learning you know, about uh, how to use it. So, so that's basically what I would have to say about the, the BMS at this point. Um, I would say that Simit, we made a trip to Simit in November of 2014, and they were very helpful. So we have some connections um, with people at Simit, Kate Dreyer, who's the germplasm coordinator there. And so um, I have a place to go to if I have a problem I can't solve. I also have connections or communication with the software development team at LeafNode. And LeafNode is really the software company that's responsible for taking the BMS where it's at now and improving it. So the version that we're working on right now is BMS 4.0 uh, uh, Beta 7, I think. And uh, if you go to the integrated breeding platform site, you'll see that there's a manual there, but it's only for BMS 3.0. And the manual is very helpful, but no manual can cover all the things that you kind of run into when you try and do something like this. But uh, so I was just saw my experience with the BMS and saying um, it's been challenging, but I'm cautiously um, optimistic about what we're going to be able to do with it. And one of the things that we also have up here on the slide deck is that it's uh, there's a, a reference to Gobi. And Ed Buckley from Cornell has, has an, adopted the BMS system, and they have uh, development staff at, at or in Ed's lab that are also assisting with uh, the development on the BMS system. And we just recently have a programmer here that we are going to um, allocate our resources for development of the BMS system as well. So um, there is some development efforts, serious, serious development efforts behind that. Yeah, I should actually mention a little bit about Gobi. Um, what that's it's genomics open source bioinformatics initiative, I think. Um, I think you can find it through Google now by um, just try Project Gobi. Um, and basically, what they're going to do is they're going to build all the tools and databases to deal with the uh, high truth with genotyping uh, data. Um, so that's something that clearly um, the BMS lacks. You will see on the sidebar, they have little spots for it. But those were really tools that were developed quite a while ago, and they were developed, um, I think, under license. And they're really developed for small data sets like SSRs. And they're, they're not really equipped to handle the high-density um, uh, genotyping data that we have now. Um, so that's clearly something that they recognize is an issue with the BMS. Um, and the Gobi project, uh, which was funded by the Gates Foundation, is really um, trying to um, address uh, those issues. Um, I visited with them when I was up in Cornell um, in December, and they're they're just getting started. But um, uh, that they have a pretty well defined set of goals of of, of what they want to do and up in a project timeline. Okay, so let's move on to slide number eighteen. And this, this is just a, a high-level 
um, overview of what our objectives, objectives are for 2016. Um, you can see that we've got, you know, BMS is a core uh, focus of the Genomes to Fields project, at least from our end on the information management side of it. Um, one of the things that, that we are anxious to receive is the last bullet on, uh, on the top group there is the tiered levels of BMS access for the GYE cooperators. You know, some people are going to want to go in there and just harvest data. Um, and, and others are going to want to enter it, and we need to be able to separate that out. And right now, that's not available in the BMS system. But that's, yeah, if you can get into the BMS, you can do anything. And but they also are fully, they're fully aware that that is a, a high-level need, not just by us, but as other groups come on board and adopt this, that is something that needs to be included in there. Um, at iPlant, They've got um, a dedicated effort to create a life sciences project management interface, which includes um, the development of pipelines for data transfers and data flows and that kind of stuff. And instead of having to go to the wiki specifically, the discovery environment specifically, they want to incorporate that into one large interface that includes everything. So if you want to do a task, you go down this path and it will take you through step by step by step to get that task accomplished. And also we can see that we have, uh, we want to enhance the image analysis pipeline using BISC, um, not just for the ears that I mentioned earlier, but they also want to do um, flyover data analysis that are, is happening at some of the locations. I don't, not all of them this year are taking pictures but several of them have um, uh, pictures that are being captured over the, the actual field trials themselves. Go to slide 19. Um, I'll just skip through some of these. You can see we've got um, quite a group of collaborators. Uh, number 20 is the, the different uh, people that are actually um, doing the hard work on the grounds, you know, getting the, uh, the individual trials set up and, and making that happen. Slide 21 is a list of the uh, uh, corn associations that are supporting these efforts in the different states to make it happen. And, and I have to, you know, give a shout out to David Erdl with the Iowa Corn Board. He has just uh, really stepped up and, and got a lot of support behind the project. And the last thing is what, do you, you know, what, else, uh, what else do you have interest in that I didn't talk about? <laughs> 